Please welcome Andrew Ross Sorkin and his guest, the chairman and CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, Jamie Dimon. Hello. Good morning, Jamie. Thank you. Uh, I want to welcome Jamie Dimon, of course, the chair and CEO of J.P. Morgan. Dimon is at the helm, as you all know, uh, of uh, the largest bank in the country by assets, nearly $4 trillion. He's also the longest-serving CEO of any major uh, Wall Street bank. And we should say that earlier this year, he helped bail out uh, First Republic, uh, which is actually downstairs in this building, uh, during the second biggest uh, failure in history. And one of the reasons I wanted him to help us kick today off, um, he is, he's got his hand in virtually everything going on uh, here and abroad. Uh, they have more than 60 million customers. He employs more than 300,000 people around the world, uh, has business in the Middle East and China, and heavily involved of course, in policy in Washington. Uh, and I will say uh, that there, if there's one CEO uh, that other CEOs say that they go to for advice and help on complex issues, it is Jamie Dimon. And I should also mention that you were our very first speaker at the DealBook Summit, the first summit we ever did 13 years ago. So thank you for being here. Very welcome. Thrilled to be here, folks, and congratulations on successful DealBook. Thank you. Yeah. Um, here's where I want to start the conversation. We just put it up on the screen. Uh, but uh, you made a comment, and I think maybe this will help everything, or help us at least set the table. You said, this may be the most dangerous time the world has seen in decades. Right. It doesn't feel that way in some ways uh, when you walk around on the street, but why do you think it's the most dangerous time? So, uh, first of all, again, welcome, everybody. Uh, you know, if you look at history and you open a newspaper of any month, of any year, now, of course, there's always tough stuff going on, wars and depressions and recessions. And, but if you look at this time and what's happening in Ukraine, a 600-mile front, a free and democratic European nation, 600,000 casualties, huge humanitarian crisis, NATO on the border of NATO, nuclear blackmail, uh, and it's affecting you know, all oil and gas, migration, food costs, and all international military and economic relationships. That's pretty tough. And that was before the terrorist attack in Israel. And so I look at those things as kind of, it's dangerous. And, you know, we need, we need to get through it. Now, hopefully, it'll all go away. But if you look at the history of battles like this, they're unpredictable. You don't know the full effect. And so, you know, and I've spoken to a lot of people. I think you've talked to Condi Rice and Bob Gates and some of the military folks. They would say the same thing. This is really complex, and obviously it's affecting America and China. As a result of this, though, yep. what do you do about it? Meaning, we can all sit and say that this may be one of the most dangerous times in the world, but how are you, how are you changing what you're doing as a function of it? Well, if you're talking about the company, you're talking about the nation. So I think as a nation... Let's go I, both. But this is my own personal view. We better have the best military in the world, bar none. There is no replacement for that. I think we learned a lesson got a little complacent, which happens in companies, it happens in countries, but we should not be complacent. The world is always a dangerous place. We just forgot. Number two, you know, uh, I think oil and gas can be explosive, ex explosive, expensive, and it hurts poor nations and poor people. We need to be very thoughtful about it. I think this is about keeping the Western world together. So the Western world, think of military and economic and, you know, it needs American leadership, not rude, arrogant American leadership, but American leadership to make sure this world stays together. And that affects trade. That affects all economic relations. And, you know, we have to do a good job at that. I don't want the book written in 50 years saying how the West lost. OK, and so that's what it's going to take. And hopefully we'll have that. How do you handicap this, though? Because it's one thing to say, look, this may be one of the most dangerous times in the world. But is that a 10 percent chance? That, it's, that this is the most dangerous time? What, how, do you, how do you think about that? And it's also very hard to bet on the end of the world. Yeah, I'm not betting on anything. So when you, we do risk management, we don't look at risk management saying, well, we don't think it's going to happen, or we do look at percentages. Like, but what's the range of potential outcomes? But my view is when you have this kind of risk, you better deal with it very seriously because the chance of something going wrong is high, and if it goes wrong, the, the cost of that will be enormous. So that's, that's just how I look at it. And so you know, I think every citizen of the world, the democratic world, should be looking at it saying, what can we do to do a better job? And the first thing is the military side. You know, uh, Ronald Reagan, you know, we don't win from a position of weakness. You, you avoid war from a position of strength. We have to do that. 
And I think we should be supporting free enterprise. As a nation, you know, Bob Gates wrote a book, which is brilliant, but there's a first chapter of a book called Exercise of Power's Symphony of Power, and he talks about how we overused and misused sometimes our military muscle, but underused development finance, the communications, like the benefits of being free and freedom of speech and freedom of religion and freedom of enterprise, uh, uh, communications about that, uh, economic relationships, diplomacy. So I travel around the world. You know, America is absent in some places. The Chinese now are all over Latin America, they're all over Africa. I'm not against them. I'm simply saying we need to do a better job at that. And if you look at our development finance and some of our stuff, those efforts have been coming down for years. And so we, we need to thoughtfully and strategically handle that problem. Just, just walk yeah. through the permutations, though, if you could. <clears throat> Meaning, if this is the most dangerous time, how does it metastasize? You look at what's happening in Israel, and we're going to talk to the president of Israel, Isaac Herzog, in just a little bit. We're having the president of, uh, of Taiwan uh, on the screen in just a little bit. I, you just mentioned China and the Middle East yeah. as examples. What do you think could happen? Yeah, well, I already mentioned nuclear blackmail, so mankind faces some huge risks. There are three I'm going to mention, okay? One is obviously these wars, which is not one of those three, but nuclear proliferation. That is probably the most dangerous thing facing mankind. Climate change, which we need a lot of work to do, and we kind of don't really have to act together on that, if you think about good policy. And another pandemic. We, in my view, we were kind of lucky in this pandemic. You know, it wasn't as deadly as a smallpox, and it didn't kill children. And so we need to get our act together to get those things done. Obviously, wars are unpredictable. And, you know, what's going on in the Middle East is unpredictable there. What's going on in... You know, hopefully these wars will end up, you know, in armistice, in peace. That's good for Ukraine and Israel. Uh, but you can't count on that happening. And certainly you can't count it happening before we meet again in a year from now. Let me ask you about the role of business in the, on the, in the geopolitical sphere. You do a lot of business in China. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a report that you were going to underwrite uh, the Xi'an uh, IPO. Yep. You do business with ByteDance, yep. uh, which happens to be the owner of TikTok, yep. uh, a business that a lot of people think is fundamentally a, a national security threat to the United States. You know, how, how do you justify that? I was in China, and you know, of course there's people afraid about you being pro-China, stuff like that. I, and I said, the Chinese know one thing about me. I'm red-blooded, full-throated, free market, pro-capitalist, pro-American. And I salute what the American government does, and we're, we're talking to them all the time about what is the right way to deal with national security. You know, it's not Sheehan. Now, that isn't the issue about national security. But, you know, when the government comes up with what they want to do, I'm going to salute, and that's what J.P. Moore is going to do. But in the meantime, it's a very complicated subject. So every, every nation has national security interests. You know, ours is semiconductors and, and uh, you know, maybe some data. But, you know, for Europe, it's energy. They are completely reliant on outside parties for their energy. You know, even for China, they import, I think, 9 or 10 million barrels of oil a day. So every country is going to be looking at its own national security interests. And so the complexity of China, we'll, we'll work that. We want, to be part, we, we, we want to be at the table and help figure out. And I think the government is talking about the right way. Narrow garden, high walls, semiconductors, you know, 100% of, of our penicillin, 100% of our pharmaceutical parts come from there. Obviously, we should fix that. So is there any part of you that says, for example, doing business with ByteDance? with TikTok. We're going to have Kevin McCarthy on. He's not a fan, as you know, of TikTok. There are a number of states uh, that are trying to ban TikTok. It's, I'm not going to go through it here, and I'm not going to talk about clients. You can imagine the due diligence and work we do to figure out what the truth is about those things. If some of those people are doing things that we think are truly bad, we would not bank them. And, of course, the American government will have a point of view on that, and we'll engage in those conversations, too. Let me ask you about... Uh, but, but, I, but I also think... I think engagement is good. I'm not afraid of China. Okay, we have all the food, war, and energy. We have the Atlantic and the Pacific. We are, we are have not pissed off our neighbors. We've got a great relationship with Mexico and Canada. You know, they have a very complex neighborhood. They've done a pretty good job angering their all the people around them. Okay, and that's and we're all remilitarizing Japan, the Koreas, Philippines, Indonesia, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. And whatever you think about Russia, they're not great friends. You know, like, in, like a mere 30 or 40 years ago, there were armies on both sides between Russia and China. So, and they have to import 10 million barrels of oil a day. They've got terrible demographics. So I'm not afraid of China. I think we should engage exactly the way the administration is doing it today. And I think it's good for an American bank to be there to help American, you know, multinationals around the world and China with their own development if it makes sense. If for some reason the American government says, nope, 
can't do that anymore, then so be it. Okay, so but what is that risk? I don't set foreign policy for the United States. Right, but, but what is that risk, and how do you think about that risk? And the reason I ask the question is we have a number of businesses. Today we're going to talk to Bob Iger. He's got a big business in, in China as well. And to the extent you think that the war in Ukraine uh, could have been a dress rehearsal for what would happen if there was a takeover of Taiwan, maybe you don't think it's a, a dress rehearsal. But the reason I mention it is if, in fact, that were to happen, if you remember, most U.S. businesses left Russia. Now, they could do that economically. It was not the hardest thing to do. It would be much harder for American businesses, for, I imagine you, for a Disney, for an Apple, for a Nike, to leave China. If the American government makes me leave China, I'm leaving China. Okay? It doesn't matter what I think or don't think. But I think you're, if, if there's a war in Taiwan, you can take all bets off. That will be a major depression, a major problem. America will be better off than China. You know, so, you know, and it, it would be really tough. No one thinks that's going to happen. It may happen. So as a risk manager, J.P. Morgan can handle that. But that would be really bad for the world and really bad for China, really bad for the people of China. So I don't think it's going to happen, but, you know, I, you can't say it won't. So, you, you know, have to be prepared for it. And, uh, but I think the best thing to do is to help the American government figure out what we need to do to protect our national security, protect our allies, keep the Western alliances together, and make it clear to people who are adversaries or potential adversaries what the cost to them will be of bad actions. That's what we should do. We're going to have the vice president here in just a little bit. How do you think they're doing at that? I think, you know, I, I think they've done a good job coalescing the world for Ukraine. I think you and I can argue they should have done more quicker and stuff like that. I probably would do more quicker. I think when you have, you know, this type of battle taking place, making it harder for Ukraine is bad. And, you know, we want Ukraine to be in a position where they can eventually settle this in a way that they feel good about what's done. And that gets very complicated. You know, I think we need to do a better job keeping the Western world together economically, diplomatically and, and, and strategically in the ways I met, already mentioned that we need to do more. And, you know, for example, for the Democrats not to talk trade. So, you know, I travel the world. I speak to these ministers of finance and prime ministers. And, you know, we're talking to them about all these things about, and I, which I'm for, human rights, labor laws, climate. But these nations need help and economic relationships. They almost kind of say to me sometimes, well, why can't you talk about something important called trade and economics? And I think we should. We should have joined the CPP to TPP. I begged Trump to call, I told Trump you should call it the Trump Pacific Partnership, and I thought it might get him over the edge. And what happened? <laughs> but it didn't work. And uh, then he did the tariffs, which I'm not in favor of. I was in favor of focusing on the issues which we all ignored for a long time about the seriousness of Chinese competitive position. And uh, uh, so, you know, so we need to do stuff like that. And I think the, the government has explained to the people why we need to do these trade things, as opposed to saying we can't talk trade because some part of the party doesn't want to do it. Why? Why is us getting involved in Ukraine America first? It is. That is America. That's the front line of democracy right now for the world. And if we haven't learned the lesson in 1938 and 1917, I mean, we've got to teach history to people. Okay, and, so we have an election coming up yeah. uh, in about a year. Yeah. What do you think of the, the, the two leading candidates right now? Oh, God. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> You're not going to tell I me. I did come out and make a nice statement about Nikki Haley. You did. Uh, you've been talking to Nikki Haley. Very liberal, yes, I have. Even if you're a very liberal Democrat, I urge you, you know, help Nikki Haley, too. You know, get a choice on a Republican side that might be better than Trump. And is that your view, that it's anything but Trump? I, I would never say that, you know, because he might be the president. And I have to deal with that, too. And, you know, but, but, but when he was I, the president, you said critical things about him. Yeah, I don't mind criticizing the president, yeah. But you feel, I mean, one of the big questions, I think, is about the business community and whether they should be speaking out or not on politics. This is a big question, especially as we get into this election <laughs> and what the right answer is in this particularly well, you're, unique you're, moment. You're going to have Kevin McCarthy next, who got mad at me one point because we took a point of view. and so When you say po politics is personal, right? So you all get to vote for who you want. We all get to debate and stuff like that. We get involved in policy. Okay, I, I will tell you all that Amer we've done a terrible job taking care of our bottom 30 percent of, of, of earners. So you're all wealthy and have money and all stuff like that. But their average, their average wages are 15 to 20 dollars a year. They're the ones who lost their job in, in COVID. They're the ones whose health is they're dying five or six years younger than the rest of us. They're the ones who don't have medical insurance. They're the ones who their schools don't work. And they're the ones dealing with crime. 
what, what the hell have we done as a nation? So, you know, I agree with that. We need to fix that. So when you talk about policy, obviously we should, you know, we need better immigration policy. We need better right. education policy. We need better infrastructure policy. But you need we, people we, to run those policies. And the question is, which, who do you think would do a better job? I'm not, and, I, and the I'm, reason I, the reason I ask who, is whoever's president, I'm going to try to help do the best job possible. But when, you when Donald that, Trump became president, I went to see him and joined that business council. Those things almost never worked, by the way. Uh, and I left it the second Charlottesville happened. You know, my daughter wrote me a long, elegant letter about, you know, basically anyone. How, how could you, Dad? She quoted Martin Luther King at the end. And I called her up, and then my other two daughters and my wife sent me a quick email saying, ditto. Like, <laughs> you're, you're, you're embarrassing us. And I called her up and said, Julia, you have everything right except the conclusion. I'm not taking myself off the playing field. I will walk into that Oval Office, try to help whoever is the president of the United States to do a better job for our people. That's my job. And I, I, I couldn't imagine saying I'm not going to White House because who's there. I don't agree with a lot of things he does. But I also want to point out, I think it's like we're in New York City, you know, the bastion of liberal society. Like, people, you, we should stop talking about ultra MAGA. I think you're insulting a large group of people, and, and then we're making this assumption scapegoating, which the press is pretty good at too, where that somehow these people believe in Trump's family values, and they're supporting the personal person. I don't think that's true. I think what they're looking at is saying the economy is pretty good, like even the black community had the lowest unemployment rate ever in his last year. He wasn't wrong about China. He wasn't wrong about NATO. He wasn't wrong about the misuse of the mil military. So that's why. They're looking at that, and Maureen Dowd wrote this great piece about her brother, you know, <laughs> why her brother's, I'm not sure he's pro-Trump, but he's pro-Republican. People should listen a little bit more to this. You know, if you're a Democrat, you know, read George Will. Read, you know, if you're a, if you're a, a Republican, read Tom Friedman. We, sh we should get out of this thing where it's one way or the other. I don't, I'm not mad at people who are anti-abortion. You know, if you, if you believe in God and the conception starts at the moment of birth, you are not a bad person. You know, and I just think people have to stop denigrating each other all the time because people take a point of view that's slightly different than yours. And, and that, you know, we're a democracy. People should right. vote and solve some of these issues. Okay, but then and, you, and they won't always be what you want. Explain this then. You look at today's economy here in the United States, mm -hmm. and you could say inflation's coming down. You could look at gas prices. They're coming down. Uh, wages are up. There, there are some good things to be said, yeah. um, and yet you would think if you actually look at some of the polls and you talk to people that this economy is not a good economy. Is it? So, first of all, the most important thing is the stuff we've already spoken about. You know, I tell my own people at J.P. Morgan Chase, the economy is the weather. You know, and people are always trying to guess what the weather's going to be. And you know what? You're making a mistake. It might snow. It might rain. It might be icy outside. It goes up. It goes down. As a company, we're prepared for all of that. My job during that kind of thing is to serve my client, which includes countries, cities, states, hospitals, schools, Ukraine, IMF, World Bank. That's my job. And I know that the weather and earnings will go up or down and credit losses and all those kind of things. But if you look at, and if you look at the U.S. economy, yes, all, you know, almost all-time low unemployment, but inflation is hurting people, uh, but employment is, is really important. I just mentioned about the bottom third, okay? And so when you say polls, that bottom third, I kind of think they have a right to be pissed off. I would probably be a little pissed off if I were them. And, and so we shouldn't just act like it's a binary type of thing. What did we do wrong? We've been talking about trying to help those lower income citizens now since, since President Johnson. And it's almost still where it was before. You know, and so I just think we've made a lot of mistakes. And, and so, but, the, but the, let me just caution you in the economy. When people look at the current economy and things are going good and stocks are up and we've had a little bit of, uh, of drugs injected directly into our system called fiscal stimulation, the largest we've ever had in peacetime, and QE, the, the, the largest monetary stimulation, two different things, different effects, but they are drugs running through the system and they create this kind of sugar high and we're in a sugar high. I don't know if it's going to end in a soft landing or something like that, but when people say, well, corporate profits are up, this is up. Yeah, corporate profits are up because people are spending a lot of money. Where do they get the money? The government gave it to them. Well, of course profits are up. You know, when they stop spending money, corporate profits will go down. So I'm a little worried that we're in that little bit of a sugar high and we don't understand it. We've never had QT before. I think it may bite more than other people. You're going to see it in volatile markets. You've seen very volatile markets. Now, most of you don't care about volatile markets unless it starts to affect the economy, and which it might. 
And so I just, I, I'm quite cautious about the economy. And I think that the QE, QT, and all this geopolitical stuff, they can bite. And I would just be a little careful about that just because it feels pretty good today. And you think that right. Jay Powell may still raise rates. You don't think he's finished. I, the prevailing view is he's done. Yeah, well, I, and the, maybe we'll actually go the opposite way. The prevailing view, you know, take a chart of the prevailing view before every major inflection point, and it's always been wrong. So, like, I don't look at the prevailing view, and nor am I trying to guess. So my view about the economy is I think there's a higher chance than other people that rates have to go up. Think of short rates and 10-year rates. The Federal Reserve sets short rates. They simply dictate it through a, and can manage it through a bunch of means. They do not set the 10-year rate. That is set by you. Supply, demand, inventory, sentiment, capital requirements around the world. And those capital requirements are huge. Governments have the biggest deficits ever, and they have the biggest debt ever. When, when we last had inflation at high numbers, you know, the debt to GDP was 35 percent, and now it's 100 percent. And that, and you can go around the world and it's roughly, we've been the most profligate, but it's roughly the same. And so when Volcker raised rates, you know, the deficit was small and the debt was small, and now it's far bigger than that. Governments need more money. The green economy is going to need more money. Uh, the, the European energy situation requires money. Uh, the restructuring of trade is going to be inflationary. The remilitarization, the world's inflationary. So I look, there are a lot of things out there that, which are both dangerous and inflationary. So I just say, be prepared, you know, it's rational if you work, work on a risk me, that the rates may go up, both the short rate and the 10-year rate, and be prepared that that might lead to a recession. Now, you know, when I worry about J.B., again, that will hurt us a little bit. We'll still be fine, and we'll serve our clients. But I think the odds are higher than other people. You know, I think there's still a chance of a soft landing. I just give it less odds than other people, that's all. Let me ask you uh, a different question about, and this is maybe a political question as well, but it is, it's about domestic issues here, and it's about actually how the bank thinks about these things. Um, for a very long time, we talked about ESG, and that was a big deal in the United States. Um, over the last couple of years, Larry Fink has sat on this stage and talked about uh, the benefits of ESG. There is an enormous backlash. Uh, you're trying to do a lot of business in Texas, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't want to necessarily allow you, as you know, uh, to sell municipal bonds in the state of Texas because they think uh, that you are uh, well, not a fan of fossil I fuels. The, I am the last woke person you'll ever meet. I don't even know what the word means. I asked Kevin McCarthy one day, what's woke? I mean, define it for me. I, do I care about people? Absolutely. But let me ask you this. You talked about climate change being uh, super important, yep. uh, one of the biggest, most dangerous issues. Uh, J.P. Morgan is a member of the U.N.'s Net Zero Alliance, yeah. right, which means that you're transitioning your portfolio. The pledge is to transition the investment por portfolio to net zero GHG emissions by 2050. Yeah. The state of Texas... It's not a said, pledge. It's a, it's a target, but yeah. The target. Yeah. The state of Texas says, well, if you're going to do that, given that we like oil, we don't want to do business with you. Yeah. What do you do about that? It's, I don't worry about it, okay? We do, we, well, you are worried about we, it because we, everybody's trying to figure out what to do. No, because we are honest and direct, and we deal with people with the biggest oil and gas financial in the world. So I went to Texas, I went on TV, and I told them, I don't understand this, Clean. We finance more oil and gas companies in the world than just about anybody else, which I'm proud of. The best companies, the cleanest companies, they're reducing the oil and gas, they're reducing the methane. They will be the biggest part of the transition, whether you think that or not. You know, and so we look at facts and detailed analysis. And yes, we're also one of the biggest green financiers in the world. Solar, wind, uh, uh, our, all the R&D taking place. And so we just do our jobs. And that's, that I don't think will happen. But if it does happen, so be it. We can't do municipal bonds in Texas. There will be consequences to Texas because we bank their cities, schools, states, hospitals, companies, 30,000 employees. And this time I would punch back. Okay? Yeah. So... We don't have to put all our employees there. I, I, just, I find it ridiculous. So I'm not getting involved in the politics. If you ask me about politics I'll, or policy, I'll tell you what I think. So I don't know exactly why they're upset with us, and they'll probably reconsider that at one point. <laughs> Same topic, though, could be associated with guns in America. Yeah. And the relationship that J.P. Morgan and the stance that the bank has taken around doing business with gun manufacturers. What's the, what's the question? The question we, we is, finance. is there going to ever be a moment we, where we, some state is going to say to you, or, or there's enough states I'm, out there that say, you know what, we're against this, and you're, and you're going to have to change the I'm not worried. If they do that, so be it. You know, I live in a democratic society, and states, if it's legal, they don't always have the right to do that. We finance, 
We do not finance people who manufacture military-style assault weapons for civilian use. We do finance companies that make military equipment for the military and the police. We help the military in every way we can. We've hired 15,000 veterans. I'm damn proud of that. Okay, and so I, I don't understand. I understand the issue. I want to reduce gun killings in the United States by all means possible. And so, and you know, we get involved in that at a policy level, but it's not up to J.P. Morgan Chase. And so we want to do a better job, but we can't. But I remember this came up the first time. I can't tell you how to spend your money because someone you know, said, why do you let people use your credit card to buy a gun? First of all, we don't know. Second of all, I can't tell you how to spend your money. It's not my job. I but still want, you want to know if you can prevent it. Yes, but you, you brought that up years ago, and I called you and told you this. The federal government sees every gun purchase and has the data. What you all don't know is that when a gun, and there are 40,000, I think, people sell guns. Again, we don't know what someone's buying. We just know which store you're in. But those, those gun uh, folks have to give the government a written record. They look at that written record to do their search, then they throw it out. If they digitized it, and we're allowed to under the law, and they're not allowed to under the law to look at those digital things. They might have seen patterns on right. these, these killers, you know, stockpiling but weapons. Since, no, the change the law. Don't t I can't change the law. You know, if you want to change it, to get out there and tell people why you should vote for this in the federal elections about that pe they should be allowed to digitize the data and use it to be looking for patterns that would lead to uh, bad crimes. I, I want to open this up for questions in just a moment, um, but I want to ask you this. You're one of the biggest recruiters in the country. There's a big question about speech that's taking place on campuses these days as it relates uh, in large part uh, to what's happened in Israel, the anti-Semitism, uh, Islamophobia, and the like. Uh, Bill Ackman, I believe, is here. I see Bill here. He's been very outspoken uh, on this issue about hiring, yeah. um, about folks who sign some of these uh, these, these pledges uh, against Israel, uh, calling for genocide to the Jews and all sorts of things. Is that going to factor into your hiring? So you, this is a, if, if there's an individual in front of me and I can look at all these things, what they did and how they did it, when they did it and stuff like that, it might. But it's not a binary thing. I'm not going to sit here and tell you yes or no. You know, and I just, I think it's unfair to the individual. And so there's no, I don't have a direct answer to that. Do I like bigots and anti-Semites? Absolutely not. Would I hire a true bigot of some sort? Probably not. But that's pretty basic. That was true before. We're going to have uh, Elon Musk here this afternoon. What do you think of him? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I haven't read that book yet. I don't know if Walter's here. Uh, I mean, obviously a brilliant human being and making unbelievable contributions to mankind, but he's, you know, comes with pluses and minuses and he's not particularly fond of me because we've had a few commercial disputes. You have a, so, a big lawsuit going on with him. It's a small lawsuit. <laughs> and we, we think we're owed money in something and they say no, and it's in court and we'll win. Um, <laughs> before uh, we do open it up, uh, let me ask you this. You um, are 67 years old right now. Mm -hmm. You recently announced that you were selling stock yeah. in J.P. Morgan. Yeah. First time that you've ever done that. Yeah. What was the decision of, uh, about that? And does that mean that we are now talking about succession for you? It had, it had in earnest? nothing to do with that. And so I half the stock I have I bought, and I've never sold a share. But I never said that like it's holier than thou. Like I was great. I'm not buying a share. I know you guys go back to. You know, oath. There's no oath. We had never had an oath of the company. I understand old people want to diversify a little bit. And when I look at it, I should have done it before. That's all. Just a little bit. It's not really important to me. It's more of a forward-looking thing for my family when I'm gone. And that's all it is. It's really not a big deal. There's no statement when of any sort. When you plan to be gone from J.P. Morgan? Well, that's totally up to the board. I am blessed, by the way. If you look at my company and the senior people there, men and women, I, I, I mean, I'm blessed with smart, talented, brilliant hardworking, ethical, people full of heart and soul and stuff like that, people who can take my job tomorrow, it's totally up to the board. The board talks about it what do every you time do? with what me. What do you want to do? As long as I have, you know, I can I, buy, I think a CEO shouldn't have this job if you can't give it your full effort. But is there I, an I age, like by the way, we're talking about right now, we're talking about two presidents, uh, two people who are running for president uh, that, you know, would be 80 plus. Would you want to do this till that? Is it, that a fair it's, age? It's not an age thing, okay? It's a, would you have the energy and the ability? Are you adding value? And if the next person is ready at a certain time, I should go. So it's, it's the, the board will make that decision. And the, the important thing for you all, and this is like the most important governance thing in the world, forget all the rules and regulations and chairman and CEO and all that crap you read about. The board meets without me 
every single meeting, and I've had them do that since bank one. That is that they can have conversation. The lead director often comes down and gives me a little note or call. They'd like to see a little bit more of X, a little bit more of Y. What about this? Can you follow up on that? Uh, and, that and then they also talk about succession without me. And we talk about it all the time, and we, we're very comfortable. We've got great succession in place, and it's, you know, we're going to run out of time, but I did say we were going to go to questions, and I did see Bill Ackman with his hand up earlier. Uh, so we're going to go. Bill has been, I should say, advocating uh, for you to run for president of the United States, as you know. Yeah. Uh, Bill, I don't know if you want to make that, that case right now, too, but um, what's your question? Good, Good lead-in. Can you hear me? Uh, so uh, Jamie said he would, uh, wouldn't run for president, but if he was anointed president, he'd take the job. Uh, so my question for you, Jamie, is, well, actually, so now with the power is vested in me, I'm anointing you president, okay? It's your first 100 days. What are your top 10 things, and what do you do over the first year? You know, so... Yeah. So the first thing I do is I probably have a cabinet with really smart, talented, brainy people. You might be secretary of treasury. It's possible. Uh, I would have Republican. I would definitely put Republicans and Democrats on it. You know, just a sign that I'm not going to be beholden to one side or the other. But the biggest policy issues, well, the, the biggest one is this foreign policy stuff. This war, keeping the Western worlds together, deploy, I would double down diplomacy, development finance. That is the biggest thing for the free world for the next hundred years. But internally, education, work skills in the cities, immigration, you're not going to have a, this, this is, this is hurting countries around the world. The, you know, the uncontrolled immigration, we have to do something about it. Education, uh, I would, I'd grow the economy. I think presidents should have a growth strategy. You know, the growth, you, you, the deficits we have today, the only solution is growing the economy. Growing the economy is supporting, being conducive to business. When I go to France and the UK now and meet the president and the prime minister, it's pro-growth, innovation, proper taxation for the people of the country. I would double the earned income tax credit. I mean, if you just what I said about those lower paid people, that would cost like 60 billion or 100 billion dollars. Putting, doubling that income, and I get rid of the child requirement. So if you're making $14,000, the government would give you 14, like a negative tax. That would put more money into those, those communities, and they would help their kids and stuff like that. I would do that like tomorrow. I'd make people like you pay a little bit more. Like, you, like this carried interest stuff would be gone the day I got into office. You know, because it is unfair, you know, and so I would do a bunch right. of stuff like that. And uh, we'll talk to Kevin McCarthy about that in just a moment. It would be fun. Yeah. Um, <laughs> hey, but, 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 but here's an important oh. thing about that. I don't think, you know, even the Democrats, I know, don't think that sending a trillion dollars more to the government is going to help. And, and we got to be very careful about policy that works and money that's properly spent. So, you know, I would tax you more, but it would go to those poor people. Um, we have to leave it there. I see the great Ron Conway in the back. I promise I'm going to get to you in just, in just a little bit. We're going to have to uh, wrap this session up because we are out of time. Uh, but I do want to thank you, Jamie Donovan. Thank you. Thank you have very, a great rest of your summit. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank, so, you thank you very much. I'll be there in one second.